Hi, good evening, everybody. Hi, this is uh, Shuvo here. Welcome back to the Real Talk with Shuvo. We are very excited today. Anyhow, we're always excited to talk to our audience. And today we have a brilliant leader and a very good friend of mine. Um, as you know, I always believe in uh, your environment is more important than your willpower. And this is a gentleman who created a very positive impact in my life. And, uh, and he has helped so many people around him, including me. So without him, this show will not be completed. So I will, we will take three minutes and I will be back uh, to introduce him and then we will start the conversation. So stay tuned. Hello, everybody. Hi, this is uh, Shuvo, uh, CEO of Success Dante. We're excited, as I mentioned earlier, to have this um, amazing, awesome gentleman uh, who is a good friend of mine. Um, thank you, thank you, Nathan, for uh, for making making time. And um, as I mentioned, that without having Nathan in our real talk with Shuvo, this show would not be complete. And I was mentioning it to him, and uh, and, and he was telling me I'm too kind. But anyhow, but that's the truth. You always have to tell the truth. So the um, so reason we started this program is to give certainty to the people out there because the things are changing and, and we are focusing on, on so many new things. So this is a way to give certainty to our audience that things are changing for good, right? And today 
to talk about this goodness and the transformation in the startup space. We got the best of the best in Sri Lanka who has contributed so much at this point um, of time. So just a brief introduction of uh, Nathan. Now he's a successful strategist, entrepreneur, investor and inventor from Sri Lanka. He currently runs a multifamily office in Singapore, uh, covering investments in the region, including Bangladesh. Haha, <laughs> that's my own country. He is also a co-founder of Hatch, Sri Lanka's first integrated accelerator and incubator, which supports the development of entrepreneurship and small businesses, a venture capitalist. And uh, not only that, overall, uh, a very genuine, uh, genuine human being a person who loves to help others. I've never seen, um, every time I, I've gone and met Nathan, wanted some help or not help, he will be always be there and, and, and help, helping me out. So like that, when you're around him, you're bound to get help. Nathan, thank you so much for being, uh, being in, in our show. And uh, so my, my first question to you is, uh, so why you have, I mean, you have done a lot of work in the area of startups, right, at this point. So why, why you want to work closely with the startups? What's the reason behind it? Shiva, thank you very much for having me on your show. As usual, you're very kind with your words. Uh, I don't deserve all of that. Um, and I'm excited to uh, share some thoughts. Um, these are my personal thoughts. These are not... Uh, um, uh, anything else, and these are not uh, filtered in any way, so excuse my language at times. Um, so your question is why startups are um, important and why do I work closely with them? Um, I was lucky enough uh, to be um, <clears throat> in an environment in the UK, to grow up there, where opportunities were easy. Um, so whether it was my first business of washing cars, uh, in the UK as a teenager or uh, making um, pizzas um, when I was 16, 17 or sandwiches and creating business opportunities. It was given to me as an as a opportunity that uh, the environment created for me. Um, I moved back to Sri Lanka during the war and it's probably one of the most difficult decisions of my life. Um, and what I saw was during that time there were no opportunities for people to start businesses unless you were selling something to the government. Um, and I think that was probably the time when I started thinking of what opportunities can be created. So you had all of this um, families uh, with long histories of um, uh, controlling certain industries, really driving forward investment in this country and also controlling uh, and convincing and in, at times uh, really um, monopolizing certain industries. Um, and then on the other side, the government had uh, its own in industries that it was managing and controlling and uh, with all sorts of barriers. Um, when the war ended, this was a time where opportunity had to be open. Uh, global investments were possible. Uh, people saw Sri Lanka differently. Um, and the large diaspora community also started to see there were opportunities within this country. Um, but um, with everything, um, it, it takes a little while to convince people and bring them on board, uh, give them the comfort factor uh, that the war has really ended. Uh, and that was really the starting point um, for me to really get in, uh, interested. And I still remember going across to uh, the north um, after the war, uh, maybe about a few months after the war, and, and really talking to the community there. They had been sort of in a community where um, anything that they produced was, was basically the only thing that was available to the community. So they were used to high cost of manufacturing, high cost of um, um, pricing, and therefore they were not worried about anything. And I told, to the, I told them today, it's very different because not, not only are you going to have competition from the rest of Sri Lanka, you're going to have competition from a global atmosphere and that your prices were going to be too high and you will get eaten alive. And, and likewise, many of those companies are not, no longer here because they had a monopoly. 
Um, so the only way a country can really grow is through GDP growth. And GDP growth only comes if you create entrepreneurs to really export uh, or uh, support services and economy uh, in a country. And that's why I think startups are very important because they're the new generation of the future. If we never had any IT businesses, I don't think IT would be a billion dollar export. Uh, similarly, we'll just be relying on apparel and, um, and uh, tea. So therefore we have to regenerate new ideas, new opportunities, new industries. And hence it's very important to work with startups to keep abreast. But for me, why do I like working with startups? I always learn something new. I'm always excited by something new. And you know, I, I'm, my wife complains I've got too many gadgets in the house and I continue to really enjoy uh, listening to startups and, and their ideas and how they're gonna disrupt the world. And you have to start, continue to learn every day and you learn through meeting people and learning from what they're trying to do. Brilliant. I mean, that's, that's the way, I mean, the way to go. I mean, when you have a, this learning attitude, definitely this helps to you know, open, open your mind to other, other you know, new possibilities. And you have always been forefront of that. I remember one time we had this conversation about um, in, um, in Singapore, they are the wearables, the, the, the mechanical wearables. The, you, we were having a conversation that how they are changing the, transforming the, the, the medical uh, industry. Uh, like simple uh, detecting the diabetic sugar level and all those things. We were, I still remember that uh, that conversation. Yeah. So, so it's purely out of passion and then and of course the learning uh, attitude that that you clearly have. So that has definitely shape, uh, taking a shape at this point. Uh, so the, my next question is, uh, what are the new opportunities a startup will have at present? Uh, if you can share some some real life real life example would be would be good. Um, first issue, I think um, there's two parts to this. One is um, post COVID, and one one is just uh, you know what what startup opportunities are there. Um, one, I mean, I wish I was 21 now, and I keep saying this every time I speak to people because the opportunities that are there for 21 year olds coming out of university. Uh, or um, anyone really coming out of higher education um, is there for them to get into any industry. Um, in, in, in our era, um, you were looked frowned upon if you had more than two or three jobs in your career. Um, whereas in the new world, uh, you want people to have uh, two or three or um, five jobs even before their age of 30 because they are really trial and erroring what they like and what they don't like. Because uh, true to fact, what you learn at university, you never use again. And uh, universities and, and MBAs are great. Uh, they're great networking opportunities and you do learn um, a lot, uh, but your practical execution is very little coming out of that. Um, so I think overall, there's so much of opportunities for startups. Um, in, in the world today because the world is extremely flat. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp uh, have all made it possible. And Geo is making it possible in India uh, and uh, also many other IT uh, and telecom providers are making it possible for any startup to really be in any platform and to be selling in any country. So um, are we, we look at many companies a week and we see a lot of companies cross-selling uh, globally and uh, uh, that would have never been possible in, in the past. So I think overall there's so much opportunity uh, for companies to be selling services, products um, globally and the customer reach is pretty easy nowadays. And the cost of really doing it is, uh, and the barriers of doing it is not there anymore. So um, the cost of doing it is very low. So I think that's the first part to that uh, response. Um, I think what's happening uh, post COVID is interesting because um, you know economies are closing up. Um, their uh, flights are expensive to ship goods out. Uh, services are being regionalized. Um, so you will see some IT jobs being regionalized in Europe and probably uh, sort of shrink a little bit in, in in parts where they have outsourced it. 
Um, so that creates opportunity for you to really focus on the region and uh, also focus on um, your country as well. So if I talk about the region first, I mean, the, the center of gravity for wealth um, was somewhere in between uh, Afghanistan uh, and, uh, uh, and Bangladesh. And uh, over a period of 50 to 60 years, it sort of moved to the West beyond uh, the UK. And over the last uh, 25 years, it's moving back here. And by 2024, it, it will probably come back to the spot it started at because the wealth has been created in Asia now. And when you look at a country like Sri Lanka and where we are sitting, we have an opportunity of almost 4 billion people that we can service as an industry, um, whether it's a service or a product, you have that population. So most people, when they want to sell anything, they look to the Western world um, and uh, they believe that's the right strategy. And that's, you know, by all means, that's the best thing to do. If, if you've got connections there, it's easy to do. But don't forget that, you know, within a, a three hour flight radius, you almost have, uh, you know, two, two, 2.5 billion people that you can reach. Um, so I think companies now in the areas of ag tech for agriculture uh, and also ag tech um, have great opportunities in here because suddenly uh, the, all the governments are really looking at opportunities of growing their own food. And it's not just about the, the numbers, it's also food safety. Food safety is gonna become a big topic around the world um, and being self-sufficient in each country is gonna be extremely important. Um, and that creates a lot of opportunities uh, all the way from production to supply chain to anything from cold storage um, to consumer products. And it creates a whole uh, opportunity in that industry to the point that, you know, Hatch uh, um, a few months ago uh, before COVID ran an accelerator with GIZ to focus on um, that particular aspect uh, as well. The other area is health and insurance. Um, health has become extremely important. You spoke about wearable products. Um, you know, the fact that telemedicine is um, uh, really being used uh, globally. Uh, you can reach any doctor you want today through telemedicine. Um, you can also get uh, your insurance uh, prescriptions, pharmaceutical um, delivered without leaving your house. And the way, you know, if you, the amount of time that you and I have gone to hospitals and with our children or, or ourselves and waited for doctors, waited for prescriptions, waited at the pharmacies. If you add it up, it's a lifetime itself. So now technology is really offered uh, in different forms and also delivered in different forms. And um, you don't have to be that person delivering it. There's um, fringe developments around that health sector that could be interesting as well. So health sector is going to be a key part of uh, what's going to happen in the future. And companies in Sri Lanka are building some good technology around that. Um, ODOC uh, being one, uh, health net buy being another. Uh, they're really creating uh, opportunities, which the traditional guys uh, still don't understand what it means. But COVID explained to them what, that, what it means. I think COVID has helped uh, both the ag industry and the health tech in industry come forward by five years because user base um, was very low uh, and this has really helped them. There are other areas like e-commerce still being important. People want the ease of shopping. Um, so people uh, who were not used to ordering on smartphones, whether they were 75 years old or whether they were from a remote area that didn't have smartphones, they've started to use smartphones. Uh, there's also cybersecurity. Uh, people are hacking into systems and uh, and, and even companies in Sri Lanka that have been hacked during COVID. And cybersecurity becomes an extremely important part and, and we don't have to build, uh, we don't have to bring in technology all the way. The one that I'm really excited about is FinTech because FinTech um, uh, really has an opportunity in Sri Lanka and there are many people who, uh, who have got some good products in Sri Lanka over the last five years, all the way from um, you know just getting your best uh, you want to go to one place and understand which bank is giving you the best interest rate. Uh, and Flipbox, for example, is a good example of that. Um, and there are other companies that are really providing um, uh, e-payments opportunities as well. Um, 
So I think that's going to be, play a key part uh, in the future. And I was very happy to see uh, the central bank taking a blockchain view on um, finances and blockchain in that space and the health space is going to play a large portion of opportunity. Uh, it's going to play a large portion of the platforms and companies in Sri Lanka have an opportunity really to get in there and really uh, work uh, around that. I mean, in fintech, for example, why should you pay three, three and a half percent uh, on a MasterCard or a Visa card transaction when you're locally transacting and you're paying a foreign uh, agent? So um, there's, you know, it's going to be country-wise, region-wise. There's going to be more opportunities created through that. Um, the other aspect is transport. Um, if you were to send product from here to um, Mathura or Yala, it, it is very expensive. Um, and it's uh, something that uh, can be easily moved now. I think there are good roads in Sri Lanka uh, that's being built. And it creates opportunities for transport companies to really uh, have a hub and spoke model for their business and uh, really reinvent uh, the delivery systems to the household. Um, and finally, I would say on the restaurant side, cloud kitchens, there are so many empty kitchens uh, during the day. How do you really utilize those kitchens? Um, there are a few companies that are coming up to really look at how do you use cloud kitchens uh, to rejuvenate the, the restaurant space because restaurants are struggling at the moment, likewise hotels. And how, if you really look at complete usage and you look at Uber, how they did the, how they use uh, the shared uh, platform. I think in the kitchen also, a shared platform will create these cloud kitchen opportunities uh, for many people in Sri Lanka. Great, brilliant, nicely addressed. Um, now that I think there are so many possibilities after listening to you, I mean, you cover almost all the all the aspects of you know so many so many opportunities. So this is so that that, that encourages um, people um, uh, to get into startups and get it becoming an entrepreneur. Thank you very much for addressing that in a, such a uh, such a uh, such a nice way and very elaborate elaborately. So there is a question. Um, from uh, one of our viewers, Eranga Mendis. So he's saying, can in uh, idea printer, I mean, can an idea printer, uh, where you keep, uh, uh, keep, where you keep on generating idea and concept startup, start, uh, start, uh, startup. So can an idea printer can be, become a startup because he's constantly generating ideas. Um, How does that work? Yeah, I mean, idea printers are, you know, there's a, there's a saying that there are um, ideas are the most difficult things to have um, and execution is the most difficult thing to implement. Um, so you do want a lot of ideas coming in um, uh, to any business, number one. And number two, uh, you know, this whole word of entrepreneur has been um, twisted to main many things, idea entrepreneur, intrapreneur, um, etc. Um, so the, the simple answer is yes, um, an idea entrepreneur can do that. Um, the best form that I've seen um, idea entrepreneurs really implement their projects has been through a studio model. A studio model in the US uh, is very famous and it, it sort of picked up a few years ago and it's doing very well. And how a studio model uh, comes is, uh, for example, Shivo, you, you think of an idea that you want to uh, implement and you think is a great idea. Uh, you bring in an entrepreneurial team and you execute it uh, and you give them equity um, for executing that project. So it might not be the co-founder's ideas, it's maybe your idea that you're really implementing it. So um, there is opportunity uh, for idea entrepreneurs to really execute on their ideas. Um, and also, I think you need people like that in corporates in Sri Lanka who sometimes are cobwebbed in uh, their thinking. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for addressing that. Uh, so idea printers are important. So keep on generating ideas so that you can have that positive impact. Okay, so you are the first guest in my audience, right? Uh, in, in my talk show who had a question before even got, we got into live, right? So shall I read that question? Now, yep. hold on, I was just a uh, uh, friend of mine, Mars. So he has asked this question. I'll just look for that. 
and uh, okay. So given the history that you have in the garment sector, right? Uh, so we, uh, so he's asking that he um, um, have, okay, in the, in the apparel industry for many years, um, I mean, we have been so many years in apparel industry, right? So COVID-19 situation, will it reshape the industry and what uh, does the future have in store for manufacturing? I think um, Shiva, are you there? I am. Shiva, are you? Repeat that? No, I got the question. Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. We're going to freeze for a second. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, I um, I think the apparel industry in Sri Lanka really reinvented um, uh, itself in in the late '90s and early 2000. Because as you, I don't know if you remember, but there was a quota system um, yeah. there um, in the apparel industry, and and Sri Lanka sort of reinvented it. And you know, my my um, former bosses Mahesh and Sheridan Ajay sort of reinvented um, uh, the industry a little bit by going into high niche uh, products that were never you know thought of um, you know being manufactured in Sri Lanka by getting into the lingerie industry they picked the right industry uh, and that sort of led the way for the apparel industry to get become a five billion export industry um, I think uh, along the way um, fast fashion came in and uh, sort of disrupted uh, the way that um, people bought clothing. Uh, people preferred clothing to wear for a shorter period and preferred to pay less. So there's an age old view that clothing has always become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and, uh, um, and brands are really chasing for price. Um, you know, if you really look at um, the history of clothing um, it, it, it was in Hong Kong first, and then, you know, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, um, then it started moving back into China and you know, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, and now it's, you know, moving into places like Africa. But along the way, uh, speed became a very important uh, factor in the last, uh, I would say, 10 years. And many companies um, after the 2008 crisis started looking at speed as an uh, important factor. And um, therefore, people started looking at setting up factories closer to the uh, brands as well. And um, it's worked in some instances and it hasn't worked in other instances. The reason I'm explaining these three um, instances to you is uh, I feel that the apparel industry um, really knew um, that uh, though the, the, um, the wall they needed to climb was coming and um, uh, it's been on the cards for a while because uh, mass manufacturing, a large scale manufacturing uh, with long runs is not uh, an industrial, um, uh, that, that it's not supporting the industry of fashion anymore. Um, so I think they needed to reinvent themselves. Um, one of the key reasons that we've been competitive has been the fact that the dollar uh, has uh, been very favorable for exporters and hence the price uh, has always um, helped them control the overheads. Um, if you look at countries like Bangladesh who have a large you know 35 billion dollar industry and Vietnam they were well behind Sri Lanka so we didn't really capture everything that we should have captured at that point um, and you know some of the larger brands that were residing in Sri Lanka uh, are struggling through in, the, in this marketplace today. So I feel there's a massive change uh, that's going to take place and uh, apparel is still going to be an important part of uh, Sri Lanka's exports. Um, like tea was at one point, but something else overtook it. So unless companies reinvent themselves, um, look at various other opportunities and, and uh, also other segments of apparel, uh, they're going to uh, struggle in, in the current segments that they're in uh, because cut and make is not an industry for long term um, and innovation, it's expensive uh, in, in these industries. 
and the process of um, bringing everything together is very expensive in the apparel industry. So you have to really invest and that's how some of the larger companies in Sri Lanka have done very well because they've invested in people, they've invested in um, product, innovation, uh, and really kept uh, the standards up. So uh, because of that, I think there is opportunity for Sri Lanka to get into a new industrial sector like medical apparel uh, being one, uh, where I think COVID-19 has helped them sort of realize there's opportunities in there. Industrial clothing uh, is another, uh, and also safety clothing is the third. So these are things that we can get into and we have a large rubber industry which will help in some of these instances where um, we can utilize the supply chain to uh, support that industry as well. So it, apparently it's not going to go away, but they will have to struggle through and, and reinvent themselves. And the days where you have 2,000, 3,000 size factories are going to uh, disappear. Got it. Yeah. Somehow you got to wear your clothes, right? So, yes, yeah, so it's not going to go away. Yeah. But yeah, but true. But, but thank you for uh, addressing that. So I have next question from Subramaniam Ishwaran. So he is asking, how can we get kids involved in entrepreneurship? Um, so the, the, the kid entrepreneurs is an important uh, term that uh, people should learn about. Um, I think it's important to teach entrepreneurship in um, schools. We are still a very traditional country. Uh, where we still teach um, kids to be doctors, nurses, and professional qualifications. Um, and that, that is a struggle going forward because kids have to build more social skills um, as they get into industries and understand that things like the social media, um, the internet of things are taking over. So that also creates the opportunity, as I said, I wish I was 21 today, uh, but that also creates opportunity for kids to really get into uh, different elements and the parents have to really teach them to try things out, uh, be creative, let them fall um, and be the cushion when they fall. Um, but, you know, let them fall uh, and learn a few lessons from it. So, you know, everything from understanding how to create wealth uh, is an important thing uh, and kids should start at a young age. So, um, you know, whether it is small things like, um, you know, my nephew um, last year was, uh, had taken some of the books at home and stood outside uh, on the road and sold them. So um, I think uh, wow. my brother and sister-in-law didn't know what books were sold, but they may have been more expensive than what he sold them. But that was one example. And, and you know, even kids um, creating, using their skills to earn money is an important piece. So I I recently got my son and my nephew to build a website. Obviously, they negotiated with me. Um, and, you know, I'm teaching them how to invest in the stock market as well because they need to understand uh, the relevance of money as well and then how money can make money as well. So kids do really need to be taught at a very young age. Uh, and, you know, in the U.S. and in the U.K., you have that opportunity because you're having everything from a bake sale to, you know, selling uh, lemonade, uh, to say making t-shirts and selling it at school. So you had the various programs like the Oxford University Entrepreneurship Program um, run in schools. So we need to run some of those programs. Uh, we always encourage kids uh, to uh, come and see what's attached and see also what's available in the future. So it's very important and it's pretty simple to teach kids how to um, really create uh, an opportunity for themselves because in the new world, I, I don't think many people will want to work for organizations. They want to work for themselves. Yeah, it's so true. But it's easier said than done right now. That, I mean, you don't want your kid to see, you know, they're failing. Uh, but but it, it's quite easy, easier said than done. When you see, um, because we traditionally, we are, we are psychologically, we are built up for failing is a bad thing. We are but then again, every time you fail, you learn something. But I learned it hard way later on, right? But, but earlier the kids start, better it is. Great. Um, okay, uh, followed by the same question. So,
as to the future. So I sorry, you cut out. I, I couldn't hear the question. So uh, she's she's asking, do you think the education needs to be changed to adjust to the future? The education system needs to be changed. Yes, um, and thankfully, I think COVID has taught us a new skill. Um, I was actually very pleased um, when schools went on Zoom and Google Hangouts um, and Teams because. Um, that's a new skill set that the kids learn because they don't have people next to them. They don't have a teacher in front of them. And the discipline is the computer and, you know, here's an opportunity for them to learn. And I think, honestly, um, school should be maybe four days a week and one day should be on Zoom uh, in the future. Because you create that new skill set and you create that online learning platform and automatically uh, you start learning a, a, a different skill and different learning habit as well. So it's like reading. If you start practicing a lot of it, um, then you start using it a lot of it as well. So um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to teach um, the global uh, learning, uh, using the global platform for learning and, and, and teach that to the kids. Unfortunately, getting kids to do anything other than using a computer to play games uh, is a difficult task. But that's an opportunity for us to use um, as a bait to get them to do uh, different things as well. Um, so the school system has to change. Um, there has to be more social interaction. There has to be more uh, physical education of uh, different types, um, i.e. Um, you know, entrepreneurship being one, but being in innovation being another. So the tradition, traditional science uh, uh, base is the exams and stuff, et cetera, will, I think, go away. Uh, but I th also think that the, the future of uh, learning is actually going to be skills. Um, how do you teach different skills to uh, students and kids is going to be more important um, than really learning a curriculum. So anything from uh, understanding digital marketing to understanding um, uh, social media uh, and, uh, and programming and coding. So it's going gonna, gonna to be the skill set and not a curriculum that's going to be the future. Um, and, you know, I feel, you know, Harvard University has decided for the rest of the year they're going to be online uh, or the rest of the semester. Um, and that's a big call because that automatically changes uh, education as well. And the cost of education where a degree or an MBA is costing you $60,000 a year um, is uh, very expensive. And, and that's actually a benefit to places like here, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, where education is, is a key pillar of our culture and uh, it'll really help them uh, educate their kids in a different form. That's great. Uh, yes, it, it's quite quite important to, to have that impact and, and positively so that uh, you know, the kids can grow up in a, in a very conducive manner, in a conducive environment. Brilliant. Thank you, Nathan, for addressing that. Okay, so, uh, we were supposed, we, we were going to talk about the startup. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to the conversation. So, I, 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 Mars is asking another question. So, um, so he's saying that some, uh, sometimes when we are integrated into a corporate sector and we are specialists in particular area, and we are working for uh, a renowned companies. It tends to be hard to leave everything aside and pursue a dream. How do you make up your mind to give up your job and start off something new from scratch? How do you do that, Nathan? <laughs> well, I, I'm in my mid forties, and I, I, you know, after um, really enjoying working at MAS, I left and. Um, you know, uh, it was probably one of the hardest decisions for me to do. Um, but it, it came with um, the yearning for learning. And um, uh, even within a corporate, it doesn't stop you from learning every day as well. So it's how much you are willing to sp spread your wings and learn and support others. So sometimes in, in, in my job, I didn't really do my job in, in, the, in that every day. I got myself involved in many things um, and the opportunity in, in an environment uh, is created to get in, involved in many things. It, you didn't have to do your job only. So I always believe this 80-20 rule where 
20% um, of the time, you really need to do something that you enjoy or uh, something that's away from a day-to-day -day, um, job. So uh, a good example could be someone in um, human resource, uh, always looking at human resource every day, but you know, it'll be good for them to go and to get in, involved in a project in sustainability or uh, get involved in a project where they're you know, an investment related project. So it's, it's important to throw projects at people. Uh, and that was one of my uh, biggest learnings is to keep people um, really engaged and involved in, uh, their, uh, in, in the everyday job. It was important to create that 20%. And sometimes people didn't understand why they were doing this 20%, but after a while they start understanding, oh, I learned a new skill uh, by doing this 20%. So I think it's important for leaders to create that opportunity for their teams to really get involved in other things um, as well. So um, it, it could be anything outside of the work to um, outside of the job, outside of the work and outside of the company as well sometimes. Brilliant. So the key is to have a learning attitude, whatever happens, learning attitude. Thank you so much uh, for addressing that. Okay. Um, we, okay. I have, um, so before we move on, I would like to know, um, it's a question from my, my side. What makes Hatch different than any other co-working space? It, are there other co-working spaces in Sri Lanka? There um, are, right? <laughs> there's, there's only one in my um, So, um, you know, the, Brinda and I have always, um, uh, when we were planning this out, always, um, said that learning from others is going to be the critical path uh, in the success. So um, having uh, startups come and uh, create a co-working space, uh, be, be part of a co-working space is uh, not the uh, only thing. So Hatch is not really a co-working space, uh, just to correct. Uh, Hatch is an accelerator and incubator. Um, the co-working is only the, the, the platform that they sit at. Um, so within that space, um, you know, we uh, created a community where everything that you needed as a startup was available to them, whether it was mentors, whether it was investors, whether it was um, a companies like PwC and Desera being part of Hatch. It was all uh, sort of curated to help people. Uh, what people need to remember is that uh, when you're a startup, you can't afford much. Um, <clears throat> you start off with people. And you may not have enough money in your uh, company to employ the best marketing person or the, uh, or the best salesperson or, or the best developer. Uh, but within Hatch, there are many companies that are um, having different skill set and they learn from each other. So what we call, um, you know, the, we, we have common areas, one third of the space is common areas. Uh, learning really takes place there. And to create an environment where um, we have that, it, it's very important. So Randula and Brinda do a great job on a daily basis, bringing people together, finding mentors. Uh, we have you know, some of the corporate leaders in Sri Lanka coming across, giving advice to startups, and they find it very beneficial, uh, the learning and the history. We also have <clears throat> many international events. Um, we have... Hatch Global, which we connect um, a Southeast Asia uh, speakers and uh, you know, global speakers come in. So we have uh, creating that atmosphere uh, where we uh, encourage people to learn from each other and share their problem. The number one problem in Sri Lanka in startups is they don't share um, their full business plan and get uh, that uh, learning from others because they're always scared that someone's going to copy you. Um, so the attitude we have is, you know, sharing is learning. And if you share, you're going to improve your idea um, and you're going to create a, uh, a larger pipeline of development opportunity. And that's what we do at Hatch. And that's what's, what's different. It's not a co-working space. It's an accelerator and an incubator to really create entrepreneurs and businesses. Thank you, Nathan, for clearing it up. It's an accelerator and an incubator. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from the co-founder himself. Thank you, Nathan, for, for sharing that. So follow that question. Now, Iranga, now you mentioned that, okay, Sri Lankan startups, they don't want to share. So Iranga Mendes, he's asking another question. 
by presenting a concept to a company which no one has thought of. What happens if the company makes a product based on the concept you have presented? Can you ask, uh, ask them money uh, for, from, from that uh, relevant company if they copy your idea? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, if somebody has done that, um, it's very unethical uh, to be doing that. Um, we see so many companies come and pitch to us. We don't sign NDAs. Uh, NDAs are a waste of paper. Uh, most of the time, it's just for uh, the legal guys to have a job um, to really create these NDAs. Um, so it's very difficult uh, if somebody is doing that. I, I feel sorry for Eranga if that has happened to him. Um, but really, the the there isn't um, history will prevail in in some of these instances. Um, I, I think some corporates in Sri Lanka um, struggle. Um, to understand that uh, they do need this ecosystem. Uh, it's like taking out air in, the, in outside, if you stop breathing, you do need these startups to come up with these ideas to really create um, new opportunities for businesses. And it's um, a sad if that has happened because uh, most uh, corporates uh, struggle to uh, reinvent themselves inside. Uh, and sometimes uh, they are also um, very um, prudent in terms of the way that they would like to develop themselves future by not investing in innovation or creating a new business model. Um, so I have heard this from a few startups in the recent past. Uh, some of these corporates are uh, sort of also um, asking for larger equities in smaller companies um, and are sort of breathing uh, more of a corporate atmosphere into these startups. That's why Hatch is a important space for even corporates to place their startups in because it, it does create a, a new opportunity and doesn't really carry the old baggage of bureaucracy from corporates into that. Um, but saying all of that, I think era, you know one advice I would give is um, always um, share a preamble to what you're doing, um, share as little as possible. Um, and then if the company is interested in investing, then get into the legal paperwork and say, this is the idea, we're sharing this with you, et cetera, and uh, explain. And sometimes you need to talk to the top um, also to explain that you're doing this as well. Uh, but uh, it's something that uh, is not easy to solve um, because you're a new startup, you don't have, uh, you can't take a legal recourse on this because uh, you don't have the funds to um, sort of uh, pay lawyers to take companies down. Uh, especially larger companies. So um, I, I think it's, it's those catch-22. If you don't share, you don't get the investment. If you share, sometimes some co corporates are very unethical as well. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, uh, so my next question from, uh, actually from Kanchana. Kanchana is asking, okay, we shift gear to the kids. Uh, uh, let's talk about the kids one more time. So she, She's asking, what are the skills, according to you, that will benefit kids in the future? Because some of the skills we have learned have become obsolete. So in the future, what do you think now that what, what are the kids should learn to face the future? Um, I, I think um, one thing that they should continue doing is just reading. Um, I think that's one thing that we need to encourage and reading uh, across the uh, 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 a board of books, not just um, literature, but also nonfiction, and then also some um, uh, things like, and I love reading Warren Buffett's books. I, I read Warren Buffett's book all the time. Um, you know, uh, um, I'm, I'm reading something around thinking fast and, and slow at the same time uh, at the moment. So, you know, make sure that they're reading different things, entrepreneurial books or autobiographies, not just historical books and fiction. Uh, number two is I think you need to get them to do some digital programs um, online uh, that are courses that are gonna teach them new skills, uh, especially around social media is here to stay. Um, so they need to understand how to use social media for their um, businesses, employment uh, and positioning uh, as well. And so that's gonna be a key part of it. Uh, third one is, I think anyone in any industry, whether you're a doctor 
or a lawyer um, or even a talk show host like yourself. Now, uh, you need to really earn, learn about coding uh, and coding is really going to help you um, uh, sort of develop ideas around your business. I mean, legal documents are being, uh, artificial intelligence is being used to, to really um, reduce the lawyer's costs, et cetera. Um, and anything that's repetitive, they do, they can be sort of, uh, you, AI could sort of replace you if it is repetitive tasks that you're doing. So in any industry, any a profession that's going to be a key task for you to have as well. The um, other uh, areas um, that I would suggest that um, they look at is how do you really, um, how do you create uh, them uh, the opportunity of uh, really watching programs that are different? Um, so we sort of encourage um, our kids to watch uh, programs like uh, Shark Tank and Dragon's Den. Uh, where they understand that innovation is coming through new products and get ideas from them. You know, I, I, I sometimes um, show uh, companies that pitch to us. I show the pitch book to uh, my kids and say, what do you think would you invest in this company and why would you? So getting them curious as to why they would invest in something uh, is another part. Um, finally, I would say that, um, you know, uh, the method of um, getting them to be employed at a very young age is very important. So um, even if it means the value for money um, needs to be taught at a very young age, um, even if it means working at a, a supermarket, stacking shelves, uh, et cetera, as a teenager, I think we need to create the laws to be able to do that um, and working at McDonald's or, or any of the hotels, et cetera, um, is very important in that learning uh, stage as well. Um, the one other key thing is, um, I, th I think interaction is, a, is a, uh, reducing. Uh, in, in our day, um, interaction was the, the most important things, uh, work, playing with people, going and playing cricket, or any sport, um, just you know, hikes, etc. Nowadays, kids are tending not to be on that. Their interaction is uh, seems to be around e-sport uh, and e-sport is going to be big, but it's never going to uh, replace sports uh, overall. So how do you get them to do more e-sport, um, uh, but more physical um, attributes to it as well? So I think I don't have the, I, I'm not qualified enough to an answer all of Kanchana's questions, but these are some of the things that um, I feel are important. Brilliant. I think it's, it's nicely said. And um, I, I, I love the fact that you mentioned about reading. I mean, these days, of course, we read a lot of WhatsApp messages and Facebook messages, but that's, that's not the real reading. Reading is actually reading out of a book. So uh, brilliant. Thank you for mentioning that it's very practical and we can apply it. a lot of value. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, for giving us a lot of value from, your, from this talk. Um, okay, Hasini. Hasini is asking, any plans for incubator for kid runners? Incubator for? For kids. Kids. Children. Children. Um, we haven't thought about it, but um, you, you know, the, the, uh, it's something that we will take into account, but uh, we, we can uh, probably create some programs. Um, there are, we've done, obviously, some coding programs. That but, had but now that you But now that you're doing it at home, right? Just now you shared with us, right? You ask your you ask your son, right, Harish, that okay? Do you think you're gonna invest on this, right? So you're already doing it at home. Yes, um, I mean, I think um, uh, we we have done some coding programs and stuff at uh, Hatch, but yes, we will we will I will take this back to the team and see if we can do something for kids as well at the Hatch. But I'm sure I'm sure a lot of parents would love to be a part of that. And then I would send my daughters to be okay. a part of that because as okay. early as early they start, better it is. They're not not doing after MBA or bachelor's, then you find out okay, uh, is the world is something different. Brilliant. Okay, so um, next question is uh, from uh, from Eranga. So he's asking, okay, um, uh, Eranga Mendes. So so he's asking, can you involve two or more companies in one concept? 
according to their value proposition. Now, for example, elephant yellow crossing, where is this? Ah, okay. Elephant yellow crossing zone, uh, promoting tourism as national brand. And also it can be used as PR campaign, as a sustainability uh, uh, protecting elephants and awareness. What do you think? Can they use, can, can, can it be involved with two companies? Is it possible? Um. Yes, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, uh, I don't know about this particular one, but I, I think ecotourism is, is an in interesting area. Um, for example, um, in most parts of uh, Netherlands, uh, there are uh, farms um, that are there in terms of just the day-to-day -day farming, but also um, the farm houses are also used as hotels or, or, or villas as well. So that's one example. I think ecotourism in Sri Lanka will do very well. Uh, specifically, um, you know, there are so many businesses that have sustainable elements to it. So you could have two companies uh, being participating in something like that. Um, it's, it, you know, when you create a community, um, um, it makes it easier. For example, a good one will be, uh, if you go down to uh, Hamantota, you have, the um, uh, the the Haman sort of zoo out there, um, and then you also have a, a farm next to it, so you can visit the farm at the same time. So, uh, creating an um, an ecosystem that um, uh, sort of covers the many things around a tourist location it, it has worked uh, before, and you can, in my mind, involve um, two different uh, companies, and sometimes doing something. Uh, uh, in one area sort of creates another opportunity in another area. So uh, a good example is, uh, you know, some of the uh, professionals in, if you were impl uh, sort of implementing something in a company uh, and that becomes a, a, a really important skill that you develop for your company, that becomes another opportunity that you create from there as well and create another team to do that and go and service uh, um, in, in other industries. So, I think you have done it, sure, in your industry pretty well as well, and how you use one skill and take it into another company and use that as well. So um, I, I think it is possible to do that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It's, it's actually the way you look at it, you know, so how it's always better to look at it in a perspective that so that you can coexist and make that positive impact. Brilliant. Uh, now, there is a question from Modita. So he's asking, Modita Atanagura, he's asking, what will be the way forward for service sector firms? What do you think? Is there any, will there be a major change, major shift, anything? Servicing firms, you said, right? Service sector, yes. Like banks, yeah. hospitals. I, I think you can't really um, uh, say a service sector and, and respond to that. I think you have to be industry specific um, I feel that, you know, hospitals um, are going to be much more automated, much more robotics are going to come in. Um, and, uh, you know, the reliance on training of doctors and nurses are going to reduce. And I think you can speak a lot better uh, on that area. Banking needs a really good bashing in Sri Lanka. Uh, it's very old, very archaic. We don't need so many banks in this country and no, so many branches in this uh, country as well. Um, insurance um, is another uh, factor. There's still too many people selling insurance door to door. Uh, that um, service sector will definitely be disrupted. Um, I think uh, the opportunities around uh, hospitality um, as a service sector as well, uh, there are different um, opportunities that will be created. I think a uh, lot more um, things like I, I talked about ecotourism earlier, but I think that it really is an opportunity even um, having guides, et cetera, um, uh, on an online platform is, is gonna be critical. Um, even traveling um, and having different forms of uh, um, support for tourists is gonna be interesting as well. So community spaces, et cetera, uh, that are gonna be created. So you see a lot of um, entrepreneurs uh, come out and, and, and you know they take, um, uh, 
six months off and they live in they live in a country to learn something new. So I think the service sector um, is going to change and uh, the future is going to be about um, how you reinvent yourself. And I think the banking, um, insurance and all the finance sectors need to be uh, rebooted again. And I think also uh, the service sector on agriculture is going to change as well, how you service agriculture companies. So um, it, it's not going to be this traditional agriculture where you know people are plowing fields and in the rice fields picking rice. It's, it, we have to automate uh, as well. And, and we don't have to have all the machinery for each farm. There are going to be services that can be provided from outside as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Radhan, for addressing that. Uh, okay, we're almost at the end. So, uh, you know, uh, for startups, right? So, may, if you can share like a uh, few other ways, like how can they gain, uh, how, how, how can the startup can uh, gain, uh, get funding for their business? Well, some of the, some of the un innovative way if you can share. Sorry, Shiva, you cut out again. I, Fun, uh, yeah, what I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, when you look at startups, right? So how, uh, how do startups can get funding for their businesses? Some innovative ways if you can share. Um, not every startup will get funding, number one. Um, your idea right. has to be good. Um, there's a lot of me too ideas that come on this because uh, uh, pick me has done a great job that, you know, suddenly you see like 25 different other companies starting up to do share, shared rights, et cetera. You have to reinvent uh, whatever, you, whatever you're doing. So uh, like that, there's a lot of copycat ideas that come across and, and not every startup is going to get funding. So, um, you know, in Sri Lanka as a small country, so the first three in any industry will do well, any sector will do well. Um, all the others will struggle. Um, the, the, the easiest way of getting funding is um, when you start an idea, you don't need millions of rupees to start it. Um, you start it small um, with uh, angel investing, whether it's families and friend or friends um, and getting their money and, and starting off in a small way and testing the idea first and sort of having a proof of concept. That's a the best form of convincing a larger investor to come in and put money in. Start it small, uh, do it, and show the results uh, of doing it small. So yes, yeah. others have done it uh, and, and they may be doing better things and bigger things and they may have been there longer, but you don't have to do all of those things to really prove it. So pick your space. Uh, I, I have this thing that uh, the most um, successful companies are the ones that are really solving unsexy problems. Uh, that nobody wants to be dealing with, and they're the ones who will do it. Um, so that, that's one area that I would say that uh, startups um, should start looking at getting angel funds. Um, Lanka Angel Network, which um, I'm on the board of, um, has a new uh, 100 million uh, rupee fund uh, that they've just launched um, for startups, uh, for early stage ideas. Um, the uh, ICTA has some funding available, and even Hatch has a mesh fund, uh, which supports um, uh, early stage uh, startups. Um, and then after that is Series A, Series B. So there are a lot of um, interesting funding mechanisms. So startup, uh, Shiva, just to be definitive, it's it's you know really early uh, seed, and then seed, then you have Series A, B, and C. So I would say up to Series C are really you know you're generating cash, and you're starting to generate profit at about C, Series C. So um, I, I think it, it goes on for some time. So uh, it's a very um, a difficult thing to get started. But the most important thing is don't try and raise a lot of money and don't give a lot of equity away. Uh, the banks are not going to help you, uh, for sure. The banks are going to be the last ones to give you money. Um, so you really need to get uh, angel funding to really show your proof of concept. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that answer. And, uh... So the next question is uh, from Udani. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very uh, relevant question. Is that one of the biggest challenges that startups are facing is uh, winning trust of the customers. What is your advice on that? Um, with anything in life, it's about trust. So whether it's a personal relationship with someone um, or whether it is um, a consumer relationship, it's really... Um, 
getting to be comfortable with uh, that. So uh, why um, people don't go on to new um, technology is because of uh, the fact that they don't trust it. So one of the biggest things that, you know, in Sri Lanka that I noticed uh, in the startups is that they really struggle to um, use credit cards and put in their details into an app. Um, and that's a massive issue, um, right? So uh, if you're going to go digital, that's going to be one of the biggest things that needs to happen. Um, they, however, are used to, you know, scratch cards, whether it's uh, a loading or preloading uh, a 500 rupee um, upload on your phone, they're used to that. So understand and, and swim towards what they trust. Um, so if they... Uh, if you are doing something that's against the grain and you're asking them to do something new, they don't um, find it easy to do unless you have COVID or something like that. And then, you know, the COVID crisis has really created people to be having, being forced to go onto it. Um, and, and people are having to put credit cards in, uh, otherwise they were not getting any food or deliveries. Um, so um, I think that that sort of fear has been sort of, uh, you know, three, four hundred percent has gone away because suddenly people are much more comfortable. So the, the trust is in making sure that you're doing things that they're used to and understanding how people are doing things and, and making sure that you can, they can still do it the same way without having to go outside and do something different uh, to what they're used to. So it's, it's not an easy task to win trust, but it's um, once you have it, uh, it's there forever. Brilliant, great. Um, so it's it's very clear. Very uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so okay, Iranga has one more question. He's saying that two more, two or more government industries are over connecting uh, to an idea. Then is there a way um, it can be executed? Like for example, cricket board and lottery board. So can can this be uh, work together? Um, I don't really know the, the problem he's trying to solve, but, um, but I think two or more government institutes are necessary uh, to really um, resolve uh, problems. So, um, you know, if you look at, for example, uh, if you look at the water board, uh, the electricity, the CEB, um, and if you look at the telecom providers, um, you know, the number of times a road is being dug up for drainage or, um, you know, uh, piping um, for uh, the, the telecom providers to put fiber lines or CEB to do a connection. The same road gets dug up so many different times because they don't coordinate their work. Um, so if you look at, um, you know, what's happening in, in the world and you, you know the next new technology is going to come, you really need to work together. So ideally, all of these organizations need to really work together to really implement an idea. Um, the biggest thing the country needs to do is have a digital ID for everyone. Uh, and that platform will uh, sort of automate a lot of the things that even Aranga is talking about in how do you connect um, many dots together. So uh, the an simple answer is yes, there are many um, uh, people that need to work together. Um, I'm not sure about his uh, a question around the cricket board and the lottery board. Uh, I'm not uh, qualified to answer that. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I want to mention something rather. Um, you know, you mentioned about um, Hatch, right? The incubation uh, based on your co-founder. But every time, the, I remember first time when I come and met you, so you, you, you wanted me to go and see the place. So the, my first experience of walking into Hatch, I felt like this is the place when you walk in, you get to apps and everything, even even the auditorium, you know, the different uh, different different table chair, the way it has been set up, the whole thing, it, it's brilliant. I encourage uh, encourage my audiences to go and visit the place, um, and and that's that's my genuine feedback, and I, I simply love it. When you walk in, you feel like you are in a very international arena. That's how I felt, right? Thank you so very I much. Just wanted to, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, you're welcome. And um, 
so my, my last question to you uh, this evening, uh, why, uh, okay, why do you see the startup um, space um, is coming, uh, let's say coming three to five years in Sri Lanka? Why do you see? Where, do you, where are we going to be? Um, I think you're going to start seeing um, some of the um, startups becoming uh, really large players in the industry. Um, I feel that some of the companies will really do well and uh, be seen as um, go-to uh, companies uh, uh, in the new era. So there's going to be a lot more funding that's going to enc be encouraged into the country. Um, I also see um, a lot of startups uh, going across and opening uh, and expanding in this region. Um, and uh, the, uh, the most important thing is Sri Lanka is a very small market. Um, you know, we have 21 million population. So if you're really going to become uh, a player as a startup, it's, it's going to be beyond the shores of Sri Lanka. And you need to start thinking about that as a strategy. And your home country, Bangladesh, is a great connecting uh, spot. Um, and also, Pakistan is a great spot. In India, you need to really know uh, the region you want to get into. But India is also a good, good position to get into. Um, so I think regional star opportunity uh, Bangladesh. We are also looking for space to open hatch in in another location in Sri Lanka. So um, I think um, you know us going out there and setting these up will also help startups from those countries come in here. Um, also individuals from each country going into these places and working as well. So we're creating a, um, a regional sort of hub of opportunities for startups as well. Um, the, the, I, I strongly feel that startups are the, the future to this country and um, the GDP growth uh, that we aim at, which is uh, uh, we would like to add a you know, billion dollars um, of GDP growth uh, through startups, um, uh, into this economy and uh, the, the struggling times of, uh, of a startup at the beginning, uh, I think they've got a massive future ahead. Some of these companies that are large um, and have been around for years uh, can get taken down by a small player because what happens is when you're a conglomerate or a, a very large company, you're in many businesses and your day-to-day -day focus is not one thing. Uh, your day-to-day -day focus is your balance sheet or your shareholders or your stock market price. Uh, startups don't have all of those baggage to carry, so they can go and bite your feet pretty fast. So I think a lot of startups are gonna start biting a lot of feet of corporates in this country. Okay. Great, wow. I mean, I, I love the ending, what you, what, you, what you mentioned. So there are so many possibilities for, for startups. And, and thank you for mentioning my, my country again and again. Uh, and I believe there is a, there is a co coexistence that we can take it to the next level. And I love the fact that you said we're gonna uh, start off is gonna add one billion dollar worth of in the in the GDP. Wow, that's 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 really encouraging. Thank you so much, Nathan, uh, for for joining us. Really appreciate what you shared is gold over here, and and I'm and I'm sure the audience got a lot of value. Eranga just now he he mentioned that. Thank you. Let me just read this to you. Thank you very much, Nathan for all the, all the advice, really helped myself. And then I'm sure others who are listening to it and, and learned, learned a lot today. Great, so there you go, there you go, you have it. Even, uh, even Hasini also mentioned something um, in that line. Uh, he was, uh, uh, she was saying, uh, okay, yeah. It's amazing to hear your thoughts and have and, and has always inspired, uh, it has always inspired her. So Nathan, really appreciate, thank you so much for being here uh, with us this evening. And then um, your contribution is, is priceless. Uh, this has definitely set a tone for all of us and, and so many possibilities here. And then thank you very much for creating that positive environment in, 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 around us and in the community and being such an inspiring leader uh, who has impacted so many lives positively. And it, this is just the, just the beginning. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, uh, being with us uh, with this, uh, uh, this lovely evening. And we, we shared a lot of knowledge. 
a uh, lot of engagement, a lot of valid questions, a lot of interesting questions. Thank you so much for asking those questions. And uh, we, we're really looking forward to see you next evening. Before I finish, I would like, I would like to mention uh, this quote from this gentleman. So he says that, I will shoot you if you don't make a decision. If you make the wrong decision, I will, I will stand by you. But you have to make a choice. This, could, this was said, uh, said by none other than Nathan. So Nathan has been a, a, such a supportive leader. So if you make a decision and you're a, you're a man of action, just, just, just get in touch with uh, Nathan. He will definitely make sure that your, your dream becomes a reality. With that, ladies and gentlemen, really thank you for being uh, being here uh, this evening. Thank you, Nathan, for being with us. And anybody can reach me out uh, if they want on Nathan at hatch.lk. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I will put that um, on the chat box after this. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Nathan. Me. Thank you so much. Thank you.